nuclear weapons effects. This is a photo of a downtown Hiroshima street before the nuclear attack. Take note of the primarily wooden buildings. So we're going to look at nuclear weapons effects. Nuclear weapons matter because they constitute 99.9% .9 of the world's raw military power and probably about 90% of its applicable power. Here you can see a building destroyed by a 5 pounds per square inch overpressure shockwave. This is a wooden frame house in a test site at Nevada. This is a damaged building in Hiroshima, 300 yards from ground zero. Although the detonation itself occurred almost half a kilometer in the air, so you can use Pythagorean's theorem to calculate it out, the distance from the detonation is more than 300 meters. But you'll notice that a reinforced concrete building like this is barely affected by a fission detonation, even at the distance of half a kilometer or less. So the effects of a nuclear weapons detonation. Most of the knowledge we have of the effects of a nuclear detonation and the blast come from tests to date. There have been 2056 nuclear explosions since 1945. Of these, 928 nuclear detonations took place at one test facility in Nevada, of which 100 of the tests were above ground. You can see here the countries that have tested. The list up to 1998 excludes North Korea, but you can see the extensive testing by the US and the USSR, and on a much lower scale, France, the UK, China, and then India and Pakistan. So nuclear weapons have five effects. Prompt radiation, electromagnetic pulse, thermal radiation, a shock wave, and fallout. Small nuclear weapons in the range of one kiloton, which is 1,000 tons equivalent of TNT, converts 90% of their energy into the shock wave. Large nuclear weapons, 200 kilotons and above convert 90% of their energy into prompt radiation. In the picture you can see the Hiroshima Red Cross Hospital destroyed by the blast. The first effect of a nuclear detonation is prompt radiation. The detonation produces a fireball of between 10 to 100 million degrees Celsius. At this high temperature, electrons, which usually absorb radiation, cannot because they're saturated. And the X-ray and gamma radiation are freely emitted by the atom. Prompt radiation is larger than the blast and thermal damage at low yields and of shorter range than the blast and thermal damage at higher yields. Nuclear detonations in the air produce a double flash because superheated air blocks visible light and so winks out of view of the fireball for a moment, producing a characteristic double flash effect. The fireball then rises because it's hot compared to the surrounding air and it expands because it's seeking a less dense atmosphere. In that sense, a nuclear detonation fireball and the subsequent mushroom cloud is not different than a very large conventional explosion. explosion. Fission reactions are about 30% prompt radiation, whereas a fusion reaction are usually 100% prompt radiation. Thermonuclear weapons are about 50% prompt radiation as they are fission boosted fusion weapons. We will look at the distinction between fission, fusion, and thermonuclear later. Now an unstable nucleus can throw off any of the following three. One, it can throw out a neutron. Two, 
it can convert a neutron into a proton by discarding an electron inside the nucleus. And three, it can discard a positron, which is a positive electron, by converting a proton in the nucleus into a neutron. Prompt radiation has five different sources that are released in the first few seconds of a detonation. First, there's X-ray radiation. This is not a particle. It's emitted as a very high frequency wave from the detonation. It's a radiation associated with the orbit of the electrons around the nucleus of an atom. It's emitted by the hot fireball and it dissipates as the fireball cools. The half distance in air is 40 meters. A half distance is the distance over which the X-ray radiation will dissipate and lose half its potency. The half distance penetration of tissue is five centimeters. It produces atomic ionization. Because it's a wave, but it interacts with electrons, as it sweeps through atoms, it pulls off electrons. Electrons are important because they're essentially, through their orbits, what holds the nuclei of atoms together. So we are held together by electrons that orbit between our atoms. To have the electrons ripped off is to pull the atoms apart. For humans, it's manifested as burns. It's biologically very damaging. For electronics, it involves the electrons being uh, thrown about in the machine. So you can think of the effect of, of wind on a column of smoke, or when you throw a rock into a, into a pond and you can see the waves emanating out from the point of impact. A second source of prompt radiation is gamma ray radiation. Again, this is not a particle. It's emitted as a very high frequency wave, much higher than X-rays, from the center of the detonation. Again, gamma rays are associated with the activity of the atom. Specifically, it's the force that holds the nucleus together, the neutrons and the protons. Since a gamma ray is a photon of energy with no mass and no charge, it is extremely penetrating. Its half distance in air is 200 meters, but its effects can be uh, extended out to three kilometers. Its half distance penetration of tissue is 10 centimeters. It can penetrate two inches of lead or three inches of concrete. It accounts for most of the radiation effect of a nuclear detonation. You can actually uh, smell the effects of the gases produced um, by an electrical storm. An electrical uh, bolt of lightning uh, will emit some gamma radiation and, and change some of the uh, elements around it. Gamma radiation also produces atomic ionization. It knocks electrons off of atoms. The third source of radiation is neutron radiation. This is actually a particle from the nucleus of an atom and it basically defines the isotope of that atom. We'll talk more about isotopes. Now neutron radiation causes a minority of the prompt radioactive effects but it's more lethal than gamma radiation. It's the most difficult to be shielded against because neutrons are heavy. Water, however, is a very good shield against neutron radiation for chemical reasons. It captures the neutrons. The half distance in air is 40 meters and the half distance penetration of tissue is 10 centimeters. The basic effect of a neutron is to hit a nucleus and to physically knock an atom away or to enter the nucleus and change the isotope or as a very small percentage impacting the nucleus, changing into a proton and actually transmuting it into a different element. Now the fourth effect of prompt radiation is alpha particles. 
These are helium nuclei. They consist of two neutrons and two protons. These are very large particles and can thus be stopped by paper and are usually absorbed within just a few yards of the explosion. Their maximum distance in the air is only 3.6 centimeters. Their maximum distance of tissue is 0 0.0003 centimeters. In effect, they'll be stopped by your skin. They also have an ionizing impact effect. They can knock electrons off of atoms. Now, alpha particles, their primary problem to humans is that they're present in nuclear fallout. And helium nuclei of this type are unstable, which means they continue to be radioactive and can emit radiation and further particles. So their presence in fallout means they could be ingested. And once they're ingested by a human through food or breathing from the fallout, they can then further damage the biology of uh, whoever ingested it. Now beta particles are individual electrons that are negatively charged and positrons that are positively charged. These can be stopped by aluminum foil and are usually absorbed within a few yards of the explosion. Their maximum distance in the air is 10 meters. Their maximum distance penetration of tissue is just one centimeter. Their effects are well, positrons can combine with a lot electro electrons of impacted nuclei and release gamma radiation. Electrons, of course, also ionize atoms. They can knock other electrons off the atoms, thereby creating burns in living tissue or damaging machines. Beta particles are emitted by fallout. Here you can see a picture from the Department of Energy which shows the relative penetration abilities of the different types of prompt radiation. Neutron radiation is the most penetrating followed by gamma and x-rays although gamma constitutes most of the radiation. And then there are alpha and beta particles and typically the alpha particles emit the beta particles and gamma radiation. So alpha and beta particles are primarily a concern of fallout. The second effect of a detonation is el the electromagnetic pulse. Now ionization, which is the knocking off of electrons that connect atomic nuclei together, is produced by X-ray and long distance gamma radiation. And this disrupts the electromagnetic spectrum, which is used by communications and sensor equipment. And the pulse, the ionization, also damages electronic equipment by overloading their sensitive and delicate components. Now, a ground burst tends to have only local effects because of the geometry of specifically the straight direction in which the electromagnetic wave spreads out from the center of the detonation. It'll impact on mountains and other objects. But an airburst nuclear detonation at 70 to 100,000 feet altitude can disrupt communications, especially VLF, very low frequency, over thousands of miles and for many hours. And so very often a nuclear attack will consist of a preliminary electromagnetic pulse detonation in order to blind radars and other systems to intercept incoming missiles. When I was in the military, we were trained, if a nuclear blast was known to be imminent, to bury some of our communications equipment. We would uh, dig a hole in the ground, a meter deep, and put our radio in it, and then put Earth on top of it. And then we would reserve that radio if an electromagnetic pulse damaged our communications equipment. Uh, there are also systems that are hardened, particularly on aircraft, that drop nuclear weapons so that they can continue to operate. Although there really isn't much of a solution uh, to protect uh, radars. Once the, detona once the detonation occurs, even if the radar itself survives, the medium through, its, through which it's looking uh, is going to be saturated by 
uh, ionization and the radar will simply not work. The third effect of a nuclear detonation is heat flash damage. Typically 20 to 30 percent of the energy of a detonation is emitted in long wavelengths. So the ultraviolet radiation which moves at the speed of light uh, only lasts about 10 seconds and pulses out from the nuclear detonation. Most of the injuries that occur when a nuclear device is detonated against biological targets occur from the heat flash damage because the heat flash damage extends out so far. The temperature of the area immediately below the fireball can reach temperatures of up to 4,000 degrees Celsius if the detonation is an airburst. Now permanent visual blindness is rare, but temporary blindness will occur. There's in fact only one case from both Hiroshima and Nagasaki of an individual that was actually permanently blinded. The heat flash damage will cause local fires and it'll inflict first through third degree burns. And many of those who have third degree burns will uh, not be able to be saved because there'll be no medical services available. So a lot of injuries are caused and deaths are caused by the heat flash damage. Here you can see assorted injuries, including later scar tissue resulting from the heat flash damage. It is possible that the heat flash damage also sanitizes in the sense of burning bacteria because there weren't incidents of large scale disease in Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the detonation. So it basically kills everything, including microbes that are within visual distance of the detonation. This is the irony of a melted fire truck. This is a fire break at Nagasaki. Once the heat flash damage starts fires, the fires behave in a conventional way, including firestorms they will burn up to a fire break. And in this case, you can see there's a road here and this road acted as a fire break. So all the houses at the bottom of the picture were burned, but none of the houses past the road were burned, even though the houses on the hill were more likely in direct line of sight of the fireball. This is two detonations an airburst and a ground burst over Manhattan. The numbers on the radii is the size of the warhead necessary to kill most of the people out to that radius from the effects of thermal radiant exposure, in other words, burning. Although this mostly applies to people on the surface, not people in a shelter or underground. The fourth effect of a nuclear detonation is blast damage. Blast is carried by a shock wave from the center of the detonation, which arrives at 325 meters per second, which is the speed of sound. The thermal energy in the detonation pushes out, encounters the air surrounding it and the air pressure, and is then converted into kinetic energy that becomes a shock wave. Now the shock wave is related to the inverse square law. As the wave travels out from the center of the center of the uh, spherical detonation, it dissipates. If you think of the volume of a cube, let's say we have a volume of a cube of one by one meter, the volume of that cube is one cubic meter. If we double the dimensions of that cube so that the height, length, and width are two meters, then the new volume of that cube is two by two by two meters, which is eight cubic meters. So doubling the dimension of a side of a cube increases its internal volume by 800%. The geometry is very similar with a sphere. Doubling the size of a sphere hugely increases its volume. And as the shock wave spreads in every direction, up, down, left, right, in and out, 
it has to occupy that full volume. So it dissipates very quickly. That one shock wave has to fill in a huge space every distance that it keeps expanding. So the inverse square law means that that shock wave loses its power very, very quickly as it emits from the center of that detonation. Now, the overpressure that we as humans are exposed to is 14.7 pounds per square inch. That means as, as we stand, the top of our head has, it's probably uh, 10 by 10 inches, approximately our head and our shoulders. For every inch by inch square on top of our head, we have 14.7 pounds per square inch that's pressing down from the 100 kilometers of atmosphere that's above us. And so it's, that pressure is always down on us. However, we are like jellyfish floating in the water. We are at the same time held together by this pressure. If a shock wave comes through and passes through the medium of water where a jellyfish is, it'll, it'll severely damage it and rip it apart. For humans, uh, we have that same vulnerability to shock waves. For example, a 50 psi shock wave is the equivalent of a hammer blow. Someone, someone hits us with a hammer. So even a 5 psi increase can severely injure us. So 14.7 plus 5 is 19.7 psi. We are very vulnerable to just a 30% increase in the psi pressure. And that's pressure from above. If we're hit from the side with that pressure, we could be even more hurt because we're not engineered to resist it. Now, a ground burst detonation creates greater local overpressures in PSI because, of course, the detonation is closer to whatever target it's hitting. An air burst that's higher up will have lower overall pressures, but the pressures will be spread out more widely. So, a ground burst of one megaton will produce a crater 500 feet across and 225 feet deep. And so we can use ground bursts to create obstacles in tactical nuclear warfare. You can blow up a highway. You can blow up a highway in particular along mountainous coasts like Norway and deny it to the enemy. Now an air burst will, will not create a crater. There, there are no nuclear craters at Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Detonations designed to destroy cities are almost always airbursts. Detonations used to destroy silos that carry uh, nuclear missiles or uh, against infrastructural targets like bridges are almost always ground bursts because you want to get the concentrated overpressure before the inverse square law dissipates the blast shock wave. Of course, silos are designed to be very strong and to resist the powerful PSI of a close detonation. Now the primary shock wave detonated over a city will initially knock over buildings and it'll kill individuals by throwing them around, ha impacting them on objects, or by having them impact on other objects that are flying around. Now the dynamic or drag post shock wave also throws around debris. And the way that the dynamic shock wave works is you have the initial high shock wave, and then immediately after that shock wave, you have a low amount of density of air. And that is a type of a vacuum, and it sucks back, say, buildings or other objects. And then you have a return to another high pressure wave, which follows that, but it's not as high as the initial blast shock wave. And then after that, you have another low shock wave. And so the dynamic shock wave will push and then pull, push and then pull. And for buildings, it can eventually knock them down. Objects being thrown around in the dynamic shock wave can kill people because of the fragmentation of glass and other loose materials that will hit them. The shock wave will also put out fires caused by the heat flash but it can cause fires by opening fuel sources, such as gas veins. Here you can see the Sedan Crater, which was a 1962 104 kiloton detonation by the US, and this was an underground burst. 
So one of the important observations is that you can inflict more blast damage by having smaller warheads than one big large warhead with the same amount of detonation material. And it's sort of counterintuitive, but uh, it, it's because of the inverse square law concentrates too much of the blast in the wrong place, where small detonations evenly laid out will then not lose as much of the blast because it'll have the blasts not overlapping, but spread out more evenly. So you don't have the extremely high levels of PSI, but you have a lot more of the levels of PSI that you need to inflict the damage. So the most sophisticated nuclear arsenals do not have very large warheads. They instead have lots of small warheads and the targeting and missile technology to place them in a pattern to maximize damage to the target. So here is an illustration that eight 40 kiloton warheads produce the same damage as a one megaton device. So eight times four is a total of 320 kilotons. So this we call equivalent megatonnage. That the four, the, the, the uh, eight 40 kiloton devices has the equivalent megatonnage, EMT, equivalent megatonnage, as a one megaton device. And you can see here, as we move away from megaton devices towards smaller devices, we produce a disproportionate effect. So you can see in the bottom left chart, you have a one, one megaton warhead. It produces a one megaton equivalent megaton effect, EMT. Then you see the 10 100 kiloton devices, and they actually produce a 2 megaton effect. And 20 50 kiloton devices produce a 3 megaton effect. So it's more efficient to have lots of warheads. If you see in the graph on the top right, this is the US arsenal between 1955 to 1985, you'll see that the total number of US warheads increased in that period, more than compensating for the severe drop in US megatonnage. So the US megatonnage dropped from 2.5 to 0 0.5, but its equivalent megatonnage, which is not represented here, actually increased. Because the US went from 10 megaton bombs in the 1960s and dropped those down into the hundreds of kilotons range which created huge winnings in the area of equivalent megatonnage. So how do you calculate equivalent megatonnage, EMT? Well, there's two formula and a non-formula. If a warhead is rated at one megaton, it is automatically one equivalent megaton and no calculation is required. If a warhead is rated as less than one megaton, the formula is y to the exponent of two thirds, two being squaring the value in the numerator and the denominator indicates a cube root. If you have a warhead that's rated for more than one megaton, the formula is y to the half exponent. So let's take a look at some examples. A 10 megaton device. A 10 megaton warhead has a rated warhead value of greater than one megaton, and so we use the y to the half formula. The square root of 10 is 3.16. You can calculate this on your uh, phone, your PC calculator, or your hand calculator. A nine megaton rated warhead can be done in our heads. Because we know three times three is nine, the square root of nine is three. So a nine megaton warhead has the equivalent megatonnage of three megatons. This is an enormous waste of scarce fissile material. A sophisticated country with the technology of accurate targeting would never build a warhead this large. A 170 kiloton rated warhead is less than one megaton. So we use the formula Y to the exponent two thirds. So the first step is ensure that you use decimal notation because here we're looking at an amount less than one megaton. 
So it's a part, it's less, it's a proportion. So it's 0 0.17. So we take the square root of 0 0.17, this gives us 0 0.03. We then take the cube root of 0 0.03, and this gives us a, the equivalent of 0 0.31 equivalent megatonnage. So 170 kiloton rated warhead is almost uh, twice that shockwave strength in equivalent megatonnage. Now, for a scientific calculator on a PC, the notation you would use would be 0 0.170, and you would use then the superscript symbol, and then you would have 2 divided by 3, and then this would give you the result. This is an estimate of ground zero at Hiroshima. This is a graphic of the detonation over Hiroshima. The orange area indicates total destruction. The yellow areas indicate half demolished areas. The red values indicate the percentage of people killed at that range out to five kilometers. The black figures indicate the percentage of people injured at that distance out to a range of five kilometers. So it should be noted that even near ground zero there were survivors. So we have 89% of the people killed immediately underneath the blast, 4% injured, and 7% survived. So the total kill here was estimated as 120,000 and total injured at 80,000. We have on the left a building at Hiroshima that was 100 meters from ground zero. Again, you can apply the Pythagorean theorem because the warhead was detonated about a half a kilometer up. But you can see a reinforced concrete building would not be completely destroyed by a kiloton device in the 10 kiloton range. You can also see another building at 120 meters from ground zero, more solidly built with less damage. The interior is burned, all the windows have been knocked out, any peripherals around the building have been blown by the shockwave, but the essential structure of the building is largely unaffected. This is damage in the area of greatest de devastation at Hiroshima. The wooden buildings have been blown by the blast damage and the debris has been lit on fire by the thermal damage. But notice that the infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, they remain. In fact, the sewer system was largely unaffected. Here's another depiction, which basically illustrates the difference in the ability of wooden versus reinforced concrete buildings to resist a blast. Notice the persistence of the bridges. If you imagine how much effort the U.S. Air Force spent blowing up bridges in North Vietnam using conventional weapons, this shows you that detonating a tactical range nuclear weapon, which is what Hiroshima was, will not automatically destroy infrastructure if your goal is to deny infrastructure to the adversary. This is a picture of Hiroshima in the pre-detonation period, probably the pre-evacuation period as well, so before the war most likely. You can see the extensive wooden structures that would have not resisted the PSI produced by the blast wave. Here is the detonation at Nagasaki. Now Nagasaki was a industrial target. There was military manufacturing occurring there, but the city was located as an extended set of structures and a, a, sort of a long structure along a river in a valley. And so a lot of the shock wave hit the mountains and was deflected upward and a majority of the city was around undulations in the valley that protected it uh, from the detonation even though the detonation was an airburst and in some sense could uh, 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 have an angle over the peaks of the mountains. This is ground zero at Nagasaki. You can see to the left the metal structures of armaments factories that were not completely destroyed, but are clearly uh, completely inoperative. This is another view. 
you can see the factories were uh, basically rendered inoperable. Here you can see pre and a post image depiction of damage at Nagasaki. Again, very similar to the type of wooden structures in Hiroshima. And again, you can see the infrastructure, particularly the bridge, is largely intact and unaffected. So the typical prompt effects on casualties is as follows. About a third of people will be immediately killed by the detonation in the attack area. Another third would be recoverable if medical attention were available, which it will typically not be available. 50% of the casualties, where the casualties are both deaths and injuries, are due to burns. But about two-thirds of all the injuries, that is to say those that were not immediately killed, are due to burns. So there is an over overwhelming number of individuals who need burn treatment. Uh, and this scale of uh, facilities typically is not possessed by a country. 30% of those who died at Hiroshima received lethal doses of radiation, though this was not necessarily the cause of death. Most who receive lethal radiation from the prompt uh, release of radiation, the gamma, the x-rays, and the neutron radiation, are so close to the fireball they were probably killed by thermal or blast damage. Here you can see a southward view of Hiroshima. So here you can see one graphic that shows the peak blast overpressure and its impact on the percentage of the population exposed and what happened to them. So if, if you look at the uh, 20 PSI measure on the horizontal line, which is to the left, you'll see that uh, you're looking at 85% fatality. That's doubling the 14.7 PSI that we feel pressuring down on us from the 100 kilometers of atmosphere. So a little bit more than doubling the PSI and having it come, uh, in, in this case at um, Hiroshima, it did come from above because it was an airburst. Uh, but if it came from the side, it could cause more damage because we're less habituated for that level of pressure. But just doubling the pressure creates uh, an enormous death rate. Uh, we are not very robust as uh, living beings. At 10 PSI overpressure, which is less than doubling, you're looking at 60% fatality and another 15, 20, 30% actually injury rate. Now, if you get down to 5 PSI, you're still looking at 35 to 40% fatality. So increasing the PSI on us by just 30% still leaves enormous uh, PSI damage. Uh, and you look at two PSI, that's just a, that's a 10%, slightly more than a 10% increase in PSI. It still leaves about a third of us injured. Now, a lot of those injuries are not simply the PSI, it's the dynamic shock wave uh, with people getting hit by debris. Again, here's another representation of those values. Um, you're looking at values of greater than five, 12 PSI, uh, ranges of five to 12 PSI and then less. You can see a dramatic drop in uh, injuries and fatalities when you get to the five PSI and less range. Here's another representa representation, and this one here is, from, is measured as distance from the ground in kilometers. So there were injuries out to four kilometers at Hiroshima, mostly debris, probably thermal damage, and uh, you can see the enormous drop-off of fatalities. Again, it's related to the um, inverse uh, square law as the shock wave dissipates rapidly from the center of the detonation. And uh, the proportion of casualties, again, casualties is both deaths and injuries, uh, increases significantly after uh, you're looking at a, a kilometer distance. But uh, again, it should be considered this is a uh, 10 kiloton equivalent device. And again, here, you've got a distance from the hypocenter in uh, kilometers, and you can see the percent killed. And as that percent becomes uh, severely and slightly injured by the time you get to 1.5 to 2 kilometers range from the center of the detonation. 
The next step is to apply the Lovelace wheel, which you'll find on the Moodle site. You need to uh, download it, print it out, and uh, get a pair of scissors and a pin and do some arts and crafts and assemble it. This is the Lovelace Nuclear Bomb Effects Computer. This was declassified in 1979 with other material by the Department of Energy in the United States. This is available on the website and it has to be uh, printed out and then cut out and then uh, put together like this. There are of course online computer versions which provide some of the information on this wheel but not all of it. This particular wheel is a photocopy of an original and the original wheel has many more parts. It's a multi-layered collection of information that calculates an abundance of things like the depth of a crater, for example. So the particular wheel we have here, which is the one that you would construct uh, from the high resolution pictures that are on the website, should be cut out into two parts. You will notice that there is an inner part which rotates around a pin, you need to get a pin, and then there's an outer part. And the outer part all along the edge is going to have the yield of the weapon in megatons and kilotons. And it basically goes all the way around here to 10 kiloton increments. It goes down to a 1 kiloton increment here. It goes up here to 1 megaton, 10 megatons, and up to 20 megatons. The inner ring has the range in miles. So I'm going to give you the assignments in kilometers, so you're going to have to make the conversion of 1.6 kilometers to the mile. A little bit of division and multiplication. So here you see there's a window that's been cut out in this segment right over here. And it's not apparent because in the high resolution photocopies you're going to see the lower wheel uh, photocopy on the upper wheel. So you're going to have to identify this little window here and cut it out. And it's easily visible because it's going to have optimum burst height and surface burst on one side and it's going to have maximum overpressure, maximum dynamic pressure and maximum wind miles per hour surrounding the window because this is going to be our data window. Now this particular individual uh, put a scotch tape cover which is transparent and put a red line down the center because we're supposed to read the values in the center of this window and they also left this tab here at the edge. So make sure that the two uh, parts of the wheel when they're cut out they're of course different sizes. Uh, it's very easy to um, superimpose two equally sized wheels on top of each other and then it'll be extremely difficult to read. So it's perfectly okay to cut out the outer rim of the uh, inner wheel so that you can see the megaton values on the outer wheel. So the information that we're interested in here is the maximum overpressure in PSI, pounds per square inch, and the maximum dynamic pressure in PSI. Overpressure is, is the shock wave, the initial shock wave that hits objects like structures, like silos, like buildings, and knocks them over. Dynamic pressure is the recurring high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure wave that occurs after a shock wave passes, and this will push, pull, push, pull buildings and people and objects and throw them around. Both cause damage, although the maximum overpressure is what we focus on when we want to see the ability of a nuclear weapon to crack a silo or a bunker or an underground complex and damage what's within. Optimum burst height is the burst height you would want to have if you want to maximize the PSI over a particular area. So you would detonate a nuclear weapon in the air, perhaps dropped by parachute or dropped as a gravity bomb, and it would detonate several hundred meters or even several kilometers in the sky if the purpose was to spread as much damage as possible to a city. A surface burst would be a detonation of a nuclear weapon shortly before it hit the ground in order to destroy a hardened target like a silo which is protected by a high density cement or metal surface. Now underneath the wheel if you peel back you're going to see some tables. And the first table is going to be a structural table. It'll tell us the type of structure, the buried concrete arch, a buried steel arch. It'll also tell us the damage and the overpressure. And it'll tell us the amount of pressure, whether it's light or heavy, that needs to be inflicted in order to destroy this target. So what you need to do 
is once you've calculated the PSI is consult that table and tell us what structures are damaged. There'll be an assignment where you'll be asked this information. In the next window, there's a probable biological effects table, which covers the PSIs and various effects on human targets, like mortality, threshold, lung, hemorrhage, and uh, ear rupture damage. And so these also have to be reported. So we will typically, in the assignment, give you the size of the weapon. We'll give you whether it's a burst uh, in uh, an optimal burst height, which varies depending on the size of the bomb and the size of the target, or whether it's a surface burst. So the yield of the weapon, the range uh, from ground zero, and the type of burst. And then you have to provide the PSI, that's maximum overpressure, the maximum dynamic pressure, and you have to provide the biological effects as well as the structural effects. There are other charts here that are uh, interesting, but they're, uh, you're not going to be queried regarding them. So let's go through uh, two examples. I'm going to uh, right away make the conversion uh, to miles for uh, simplicity's sake. But in the assignment, you simply multiply the number of kilometers by um, uh, uh, one, 1 1.6 in order to get the, uh, the miles. Or rather, you divide it by 1.6. So let's imagine a one megaton device at one mile. Now let me uh, alert you here, when you read the outer rim, you've got here a one, and then a two, and then a three, and then a four, and those are ranges in miles. When you go below one, if you look very carefully, there'll be a decimal. That's a 0 0.9, a 0 0.8, a 0 0.7, a 0 0.4, a 0 0.25, a 0.2, a 0.1, a 0 0.07, a 0 0.05. That's 50 meters from a nuclear blast. This matters, especially if you're dealing with tactical nuclear weapons. So let's maneuver our one megaton button. Here we've got the one megaton on the outer ring. And we're going to rotate this ring around until we get to one mile. So there we've got one mile and one megaton. And then we consult this, for you, imaginary red line down the center of this open window. And you'll notice we've got three rings. The bottom ring is the maximum wind. We're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on maximum dynamic pressure and maximum overpressure. Now, let's imagine that we have both an optimum burst height and a surface burst. So we would read both of those values. So the maximum overpressure in PSI from an optimum burst height of a one megaton device at one mile range is and we can see here the value of 60. A surface burst would be 40 down here. For maximum dynamic pressure, the optimum burst height, at the optimum burst height, uh, would create a PSI of 200 and would create a surface burst of 30 PSI. Okay, and so you would report those numbers and then use those numbers to consult the charts underneath the ring in order to report the effects of those strikes. So let's go now to a much smaller weapon. Let's go to a, a 10 kiloton weapon. Okay, a 10 kiloton weapon um, at uh, half a mile. Okay, so a 10 kiloton weapon is over here. We can see 10 kT and we see here 0.5 of a mile. So it's a much smaller weapon at half of the distance. And we can see here Again, looking at the center of the window, we can see here for maximum overpressure, optimum burst height, we've got about 12 PSI. A surface burst for maximum overpressure is about 6.25 or 6.5 PSI. For maximum dynamic pressure, the optimum burst height will create 3 PSI, and a surface burst will create what looks like a 0.8 PSI. Now what happens if I give you a, let's say a very close distance for a, a 10 megaton device. So let's say we have a 10 megaton device and it's going off um, half a mile away. So we line up the 10 megatons and the half mile and oh look, the window with the red line is, is in a chart. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're off the scale. It means that at this instant, the detonation is so large that the target is physically standing inside the fireball. And in that plasma ball, the laws of physics are, uh, well, not undermined, but the bonds, the uh, nucle nuclear bonds between the, the uh, nuclei of atoms um, has been suspended, 
And so you've got free electrons flying all over the place and basically total disintegration of matter. And so there's nothing to report. Um, the PSI is off the scale. Uh, there's total devastation and destruction of matter uh, within that incredibly hot ball of fire. Now you can apply the effects of the Lovelace Wheel on your own city. Montreal is located on the International Seaway. If a nuclear war had occurred during, say, a confrontation with the Soviet Union in Europe, it's very likely the Soviet Union would have tried to stop the resupply of Europe with tanks. And many of the tanks that the U.S. manufactures are in Detroit. And so they would have passed on ships and trains going through Montreal. And so the Soviets likely would have struck Montreal with an SS-18 Satan intercontinental ballistic missile, which is still the largest ICBM in the world, and they're still operational as of uh, the time of this video. Uh, it would drop uh, about 10 warheads, which is how many warheads we estimate are in that missile, and these would be MIRV, multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles that would then spread out against different targets like the airport, the International Seaway, uh, the dam at Cornwall, and uh, it would cause enormous damage. Each warhead is probably 200 kilotons. So you can calculate the conditions over Montreal of a airburst. And the conditions would be, you know, here I have 2 p.m. January uh, with clear weather and 20 kilometers visibility. So you won't have a lot of the thermal effects uh, basically reflected by the atmosphere or by clouds. So this is a rule of thumb of the effects of a detonation. At ground zero, you're, which is the, uh, the main impact of the detonation, you're looking at um, uh, a complete flattening of the area. Uh, some buildings will survive. Out to 800 meters, you're looking at lethal radiation of up to 1,000 rems. At 1,200 meters, you're looking at about 50% of the heavy structures being affected, and the prompt radiation is reduced down to about 100 rems. At 3,500 meters, you're looking at about 50% of the vehicles being disabled. At 4,100 meters, you're looking at about 50% of those are injured that are in defilade, meaning they're behind cover. But they're injured nonetheless by the shock wave rebounding off another surface uh, or the thermal radiation before they got cover. At 5,900 meters, you're looking at 50% of the casualties of those that are in the open and are not under cover. And out to eight kilometers, uh, housing is uninhabitable because of minor fires, broken windows, possible water and gas veins are damaged. Now the fifth effect of a nuclear detonation is fallout. An airburst minimizes fallout because the fireball does not make contact with the surface and therefore doesn't drag the surface material mixed with the alpha particles up into the mushroom cloud, which is then distributed into the higher atmosphere, which then comes down again. Fallout varies very widely depending on the prevailing winds, and it's not necessarily visible. As peculiar as it sounds, navies spend a significant amount of effort cleaning their decks. They have a, something called a citadel system where there's a spraying system to get the radioactive fallout off the ship because the radioactivity uh, interferes uh, with the radar equipment and the communications equipment and with the crew. So even though detonating a nuclear weapon to, next to a ship would hit only the ocean, that water would be highly radioactive. But it's not, doesn't look like fallout, doesn't look like burning ash. It is completely invisible. So fallout is the result of neutrons impacting on non-radioactive material and rendering them radioactive, either by changing the isotope, which means the element stays the same, but it has an additional neutron in the nucleus, uh, or it actually transmutes the element into another element which is unstable. And you also have the byproducts of the detonation, like the alpha particles, which are the partially detonated uh, uh, nuclei that were used as the fuel. And you also have the undetonated portions of the bomb, not a lot, 
when you have a nuclear reactor that goes into a meltdown and detonates, there's a lot more nuclear material that's spread around. So Fukushima and Chernobyl um, uh, actually inflicted more damage on their environment in terms of radi radioactivity than the remnant warhead of a, of a nuclear device. A nuclear device is going to have several kilos of a uh, of of the warhead in fissile material, where a reactor will have several tons, uh, you know, maybe a thousand. Um, uh, uh, weight more or mass more of uh, radioactive materials. Now there's 300 different isotopes of 36 elements that can be produced by the neutrons impacting and transmuting or changing the isotopes uh, in a normal environment. Now the motion of fallout is typically described by, by the mathematics of Brownian motion, which is sort of a random walk. In other words, um, you have a type of motion in which the math describes cumulatively without reference to what happened before. So it's sort of an independent sequence. Now obviously there are prevailing winds and the prevailing winds depend on the relationship of the continents to the oceans and to the circular patterns of both the oceans and uh, the weather and the slipstream. So there's a lot of factors and it's not, it, there's no general rule for the um, uh, direction that fallout takes. So you're going to get a lot more fallout if you have a ground burst because the detonation of fireball is going to pick up the earth that's radioactive, move it into the sky and then spread it around. Uh, and uh, uh, we associate ground bursts with counter force strikes, uh, counter values when you hit cities and people, counter forces when you're hitting uh, other nuclear weapons. So you're detonating a nuclear weapon close to an, a silo that holds the enemy's nuclear weapon. You're going to be using a ground burst because you want to maximize the PSI against the silo. You're going to get a lot of fallout from that. So uh, a war where you're not attacking cities, but you're attacking only military assets, you're going to be creating an order of magnitude greater quantity of fallout. So uh, uh, that kind of war where you're sparing the cities is not necessarily um, uh, completely safer for uh, human uh, inhabitants or uh, agriculture uh, and animals. So here you can uh, see um, one variant which you're going to see in your Canadian government publication on how to prepare for a nuclear war and here you can see the uh, different altitudes at which the cloud dissipates Now this is the uh, fallout pattern over a 20 kilometer northwest distance from Hiroshima. Uh, there was a heavy rainfall in the area that was immediately to the uh, northwest of Hiroshima and uh, lighter rainfall beyond that. And although Hiroshima was an airburst, there was nonetheless fallout created by the uh, prompt radiation and the neutrons impacting uh, the material from the airburst and then some of that air some of that material um, being uh, sent into the atmosphere by the fires caused by the thermal damage and the uh, gas fires uh, caused by the shock wave uh, knocking over cooking stoves and um, other devices that uh, causes incendiaries uh, you can also see here uh, where there's sort of a circle with a line in it, these are sites where scattered materials fell. So uh, the detonation did throw some uh, discrete debris um, kilometers away from the site, but it still doesn't constitute a thick layer of um, fallout that you would get uh, if there was a ground burst at Hiroshima. This is uh, the fallout from a detonation in China and it shows how the uh, radioactive material from that detonation, which was a very likely not a ground burst but an air burst, could nevertheless be detected as it uh, passed uh, in the upper atmosphere and what looks like uh, where the slipstream uh, would be. Here is a graph that represents the height of a warhead and its yield in kilotons. Obviously as a warhead has a bigger yield in kilotons, the fireball will be larger and the key 
in indicator is whether the fireball touches the surface. And that, that has a huge impact on the volume of the fallout. So you can see whether you have no fallout, no local fallout or local fallout, and it has to do with the size of the warhead. So if you're looking at a 600 kiloton device, the warhead will touch the ground at 700 meters. Now I've seen a 50 to 100 meter fireball created by a conventional detonation because I was an army engineer officer for 15 years and I've blown up some pretty big bridges and the, we would enhance the fireball detonations by using uh, double layered garbage bags of gasoline. And so you, you create these conventional detonations that look almost identical uh, in, in the mushroom cloud and the, the fireball that precedes it. Uh, and the reason, just to explain, the reason you have a mushroom cloud is the fireball, you have the initial detonation, it's a completely spherical orange yellowish ball. Uh, and it, it, it occurs instantly. And then this ball goes up in the air and as it rises, it's, it's like a crystal ball, it fills in with gray and black smoke as uh, the air um, uh, uh, dissipates the energy. And then you have sort of, it's, it's like a, a, a toroid, like a donut that's rotating in. Um, uh, you have this rotation um, from the top, like it's a donut, uh, to uh, the outside and down. And so you have this formation that goes up um, and it leaves behind it a tail. And that's, that's the, the, the stump of the mushroom. And so this, this will, mushroom cloud will go up in the air and then it'll, it'll lose its toroid shape and become sort of a, a, a diffuse cloud. Um, and so um, you can imagine a 600 kiloton detonation um, is just going to be seven times bigger. And um, which is, which is not, it seems like large, you know, 700, um, a 700 meter um, ball. Um, but uh, in fact, it's, it's not much bigger than a, than a very large conventional uh, detonation. So it's not, not anything completely magical. What's different is, of course, the enormous uh, shockwave and the radiation and the thermal effects. So fallout in Nagasaki and Hiroshima was uh, largely um, negligible, right? Although you could, again, detect, you can detect parts of the city that um, were sent up into the air and came down somewhere else. Because the air bursts occurred at 500 to 600 meters above the surface, we're gonna look at, at those detonations in much more detail in terms of the actual strength and the location of the devices. Um, radiation sickness uh, tends to lead to weakened immune systems and short-term treatment is difficult. We're going to look at this uh, more in another lecture. Um, there are questions about how much radiation someone has been exposed to and uh, you know whether the, the symptoms someone is displaying, whether they're shock or radiation, because those symptoms are uh, very similar uh, to each other, particularly the symptom of vomiting, which occurs both if you suffer from radiation or if you think you're suffering from the effects of radiation. So we're going to take a look at uh, some of these in, in the next lecture on the effects of uh, a nuclear detonation on human biology. Here you can see a projected fallout pattern of a nuclear conflict uh, between the Soviet Union and the US. And it's basically uh, the epicenters are military targets, cities and airfields and uh, energy facilities. Uh, and you can see the prevailing weather patterns, whatever they are in that given moment, because the weather patterns change all the time, uh, will then shift a uh, downward fallout um, uh, from, that, uh, from that point of detonation. So some of the radiation effects, uh, we're gonna look at these later on when we look at the um, nuclear effects on biology, but 1,000 to 2,000 rems is going to make survivable, surviving improbable. Uh, and for a very large device, that could be three to five kilometers from ground zero, depending on how large the um, ground burst was. But we're looking here at a very large uh, warhead throwing up a lot of fallout. Uh, 200 to 1,000 rams uh, gives you a 50% chance. The range is out uh, to 50 kilometers, depending again on the dispersal of the fallout. Um, 100 to 200 rams will leave an illness. Uh, 25 to 100 rams will, will leave no uh, detected illness, but you, you do have a permanent um, linear damage when you're exposed to radiation. Now, normally the rule of thumb is uh, 10 to 30 days to avoid fallout. Of course, the fallout is not evenly distributed and you can buy yourself a geyser counter and walk outside your bomb shelter or basement and measure the amount of radiation. 
Uh, but as a general rule, on average, radioactive effects are reduced by a factor of 10 for every sevenfold increase in time. In other words, for every factor of 10, um, uh, uh, a factor of 10 means you divide the radioactive effect by 10. And so for every seven hours that you wait, you can divide the amount of radiation by 10. So if you were to wait seven hours, you're going to reduce the radiation by 90%. But that 10% is, you know, it's going to take you from 2,000 rems to 200 rems, and it's still going to kill you half the time. So you wait another uh, uh, a, a, a seven time factor of that. Uh, seven times seven is 49. That's 49 hours, which is two days. You wait two days, you've reduced that to 99%. So that'll take you from 2,000 rems down to 20 rems. And you're basically looking at um, no illness, but you've accumulated a linear, linear quantity of radiation. And if you wait another factor of 10, uh, a factor of 7, you're looking at 7 times 7 times 7, which is, of course, 343 hours. Uh, it's basically 7 times 2 days, which is 2 weeks. So if you wait 2 weeks, you've gotten rid of 99.9% .9 of the radiation. It's a thousand times less radiation. It's, children are still vulnerable because they're growing, and we'll look at that in more detail in another lecture. But um, for going outside and clearing debris and getting back to work, um, uh, it, it, which is uh, productivity, is an enormously important factor for countries to both rebuild and continue the war, or you know just just to survive and and manage the destruction of infrastructure and people. You want to get people out there as quickly as possible. Having your population. Uh, not working uh, in a shelter for two weeks is enormously costly. So there are, of course, trade-offs here. Um, it's, uh, it, it's in the realm of moral and difficult choices that individuals and governments have to make about how long they want people to um, be protected from the radiation. Here again, you can see the graphic from the Canadian government's handout that uh, you have access to. You can see the fallout decay. Um, after one hour, there's no change. Seven hours is a 90% drop. 48 hours is a 99% drop. And then uh, after two weeks, which is seven times seven times seven in hours, you have a 99.9% .9 drop in uh, radiation from the fallout. Right? If you have uh, prompt radiation uh, hit your house, uh, remember, uh, most of the, the half distance of that radiation is, is, drops off very quickly from the center. And furthermore, only the neutrons are really going to permanently uh, uh, damage the environment in the sense of creating uh, radioactivity. A lot of the alpha particles are, are going to remain with the fallout, or they're going to remain near where the detonation is. They might be carried by the wind uh, as fallout. But the prompt radiation in the form of gamma and x-ray is going is to ionize, it's going to pull electrons off, but it's not going to transmute or leave radiation itself. Once it passes, it's gone. So it's really the neutron effects. And the neutron effects you know they're they're penetrating, but if your house is very far away, it's not going to generate fallout just because it's in the line of sight from the detonation. Here we're really looking at the burning of the city and that burning uh, uh, creating carbon and carrying the radioactive uh, carbon isotopes that were transmuted by the neutrons into the air, along with the alpha particles that then create the beta particles, and then it comes down as ash around uh, the farms and your house and into the water supply. Now there are secondary effects of uh, nuclear attacks. You're going to have disease. Well, we, we proposed that disease could happen, but uh, in fact there were no outbreaks of disease, disease at either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. You can think of a breakdown of sanitation, although as I mentioned before, you know, your, your local water plant will be without energy and probably completely destroyed. Uh, and you know, the radioactivity does affect uh, water. Uh, even though uh, water is a good barrier for neutron radiation, what water does, in fact, is it, it absorbs the um, neutron and becomes a heavy element of water, which is actually not only um, unstable and radioactive, although although not not uh, hugely um, dangerous as a radioactive element, uh, it's uh, isotope rather, uh, um, but it is toxic. Uh, some isotopes of otherwise um, healthy elements are toxic. And so uh, deuterium and tritium, which is heavier versions of water with uh, additional uh, neutrons, uh, should not be ingested, obviously, Al although there is a, a natural quantity of it in the drinking water. Um, uh, there's also uh, you know, just a general breakdown of sanitation, uh, wh which can uh, cause problems with disease and make uh, medical treatment difficult. There's a shortage, of course, of medical help. Um, 
there's a water and food shortage uh, if outside of the city there's no reserve capacity. Um, the farmers outside the city might be overwhelmed. They might be out of season. They might not have any food stocks. Um, there's, of course, deaths of those who are dependent on medical technology to survive, like diabetics, those that need um, dialysis machines. Here you can see the refugees escaping the attack at Hiroshima. And you can also see, in, in peculiarly at the bottom right, um, refugees that went home, that went back. Uh, and you can see here a well, which obviously is an important factor. If it's groundwater, it's probably safe. And so uh, people, once the, uh, the situation is stabilized, they go home pretty quickly, because where else would they go? Again, here are refugees. Uh, there were, again, no major epidemics at either Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it's speculated that the uh, intense heat of the thermal effect acted as a uh, dis, uh, disinfectant. Some of the longer term effects are, are wildly speculative. This is from the book by Herman Kahn on thermonuclear war publication from the 60s in which he explored large scale nuclear war and he um, thought about long term genetic effects. And as we'll, we'll see later on, uh, the genetic effects of being exposed to radiation uh, have been exaggerated. So uh, we'll look at that when we look at the effects of radiation on, on human health. Now the big question that comes out of the effect of a nuclear detonation is the is the effect of multiple nuclear detonations and can nuclear war end civilization and it's a it's an important question i think it should be considered that uh, most nuclear weapons even at the height of the cold war when we had uh, several gigatons worth of nuclear detonation capacity most of the world was not targeted the nuclear weapons were going to hit cities in North America and uh, Europe, Eurasia, China, Japan, uh, maybe some targets in Australia, uh, several targets in the Middle East, uh, mainly the oil producing areas, probably the canals, um, maybe uh, uh, the, the Dardanelles, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar, maybe South Africa because it's an important point for the transshipment of oil tankers, maybe the Panama Canal. Um, but large parts of the world were going to be unaffected. Um, so uh, Africa was mostly not going to be nuked. South America, not going to be nuked. Now, yeah, they were going to be exposed to fallout, but fallout doesn't cause immediate death. It causes long-term health problems. Uh, and it can interfere with uh, reproductive health. Uh, but again, generally, cancers affect people later on in life. Uh, and radiation builds up that vulnerability in later life. So, uh, as with most large-scale human disasters, migration solves a lot of the problems. Um, Bangladesh has 160 million people. It's not inconceivable that they would simply take boats and migrate and reoccupy and repopulate those parts of the world that were vacated by large-scale nuclear war and the secondary effects, the political chaos, the breakdown of civilization, um, and uh, those secondary effects. Uh, well, the Bangladeshis do have a Nobel Prize winning uh, author, and so um, uh, Tagore, and so um, the movement of peoples would just renew civilization. So it's very unlikely we would end civilization. It doesn't mean we won't end civilization in the future, because a nuclear war in conjunction with other disasters or a protracted nuclear war in which nuclear war becomes normalized and the main instrument of violence. Uh, you can definitely see societies fight themselves into non-existence. And for this, we, you know, we're going to talk about this later, but we refer to the Bronze Age collapse when um, some environmental phenomenon that's not entirely clear uh, disrupted uh, almost every civilization on planet Earth around 1100 uh, uh, before the Common Era, 1100 uh, years before Christ, 1100 BC. So uh, nuclear war could have that kind of effect. And the effect was to de-urbanize the entire world, probably because of a huge drop in agricultural production. And that meant an end to literacy. Um, and it destroyed um, the Indus uh, civilizations. Uh, virtually every uh, urban uh, civilization in the Near East and Europe, uh, the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, um, but, but only the Egyptians survived. And China was at too low a level of urbanization at the time. It had a couple of cities like Zhengzhou, um, 
and uh, but it 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 um, it basically didn't have the huge cities like the Near East did that were vulnerable to a sudden loss of food supply. So um, disasters have happened in the past, but out of out of that disaster came our classical civilization. Um, the Mycenaeans turned into the Greeks. The the Canaanites uh, turned into the Jews. The uh, Semitic peoples on the coast of the East Mediterranean turned into the Phoenicians, and these people had a uh, new dynamism, although um, they had some memory through Homer uh, and the Iliad of the, of the um, pre-classical period, which influenced them, they created a new culture, and these cultures affect us to this day. So, can nuclear war end civilization? Unlikely. Much more likely they're going to transform uh, civilization. Um, uh, and and uh, for there to be that scale of destruction, you, you would basically have to um, also target uh, South America and Africa and South Asia and uh, other areas uh, that are basically um, preserves of human civilization. So this would be an excellent paper. Uh, it's one of the big issues everyone discusses and it's very often flippantly uh, treated by journalists and uh, not really thought of in a clear and profound fashion.